Hey everybody, in this video, we are going to do the Unit 6 test based on enthalpy. So these will be 16 multiple choice questions that I chose, and all of them are from the Chemistry Olympiad except number 16. So some of them will be quite a challenge, but don't worry, we can get through these and we will learn a lot in the process. So on the right, I labeled all the videos that correspond to the questions, and yeah, without further ado, let's begin doing the questions. Number one, for which of these is delta HFF not, not equal to zero? So if you remember, the elements in their natural form found most commonly in nature will have heats of formation that are equal to zero. So we need to find the odd one out. So, bromine exists in nature as a diatomic molecule and it's liquid, so that will have a heat of formation of zero, so A is out. Iron is found in nature as a single atom and it's a solid, so that's out. And iodine is found as a diatomic solid in nature, so that's out. And O3, well, is oxygen's most common form O3? No, it's actually O2 gas. O3 is ozone. And this is not commonly found in nature, even though it's an element. And if you remember, these two are known as allotropes because they are both made of oxygen, but of course they are shaped differently, or maybe they have different number of atoms. So these two are allotropes, but O3 is less common and less natural than O2. Even though we find O3 in our atmosphere, but it's not as common as O2, definitely. So let's move on to the next question. The enthalpy change for which reaction represents the standard enthalpy of formation for hydrogen cyanide, HCN? So it's going to be in the gaseous form. And we have to figure out which reaction represents the standard enthalpy of formation. So Remember, the enthalpy of formation is for one mole of product, so we have to find which reaction will produce one mole of HCN from its natural elements. So it looks like C is out because HCN has to be formed and not, you know, broken down. And D is out because we need one mole to be formed and not two moles to be formed. And A and B are our only options left. So A is out because H does not exist as H naturally in nature. Instead, hydrogen exists as H2 in nature. So H2 is in nature, C is in nature, and N2, nitrogen gas, is also in nature. And all of these are in the right coefficients, and they form one mole of HCN. So B is our answer. Now let's look at number three. What is the standard enthalpy of formation of MgO solid if 300.9 kilojoules is evolved when 20.15 grams of magnesium oxide is formed by the combustion of magnesium under standard conditions? Wow, okay. So it's asking for a lot, but we could try to figure this out. So let's write out the standard enthalpy of formation reaction of magnesium oxide. So it would be magnesium plus one half O2, since that's the natural form of oxygen. And we get as a result, MgO solid. Okay, and then it states that 300.9 kilojoules is evolved when 20.15 grams of magnesium oxide is formed by the combustion of magnesium which is basically when magnesium reacts with oxygen. That's what combustion means. So isn't it weird that the combustion of magnesium is the same as the standard enthalpy of formation reaction for magnesium oxide? Because if you think about it, this right here is the combustion reaction where magnesium undergoes combustion with O2 gas to get magnesium oxide. What a coincidence, right? And our goal is to find the delta H of F for this reaction right here. And it tells us that when 20.15 grams of magnesium oxide is formed, 
then 300.9 kilojoules is evolved or released in the reaction. So basically, we have to convert the grams to moles, and notice that 20.15 grams divided by 40.30 grams per mole will give us 0 0.5000 moles of magnesium oxide that is formed, and this formation corresponds to a release of 300.9 kilojoules, and when energy is released by reaction, the delta H is going to be negative, so the heat is going to overall be negative, so minus 300.9 kilojoules. But we have a little problem here. We want to find the delta H, which is for one mole of MgO, and this is because the standard enthalpy formation is for one mole of MgO and not 0.5 moles of MgO. So how do we fix that? Well, if we remember, delta H is equal to Q over moles. So our Q is negative 300.9 kilojoules, and our moles is 0 0.5000 moles of MgO formed. Now, the delta H of the formation reaction will essentially become negative 601.8 kilojoules per mole of MgO formed. And this is our answer, and it seems like the answer will be A. Let's look at the next question. Which equation best represents the reaction for the standard enthalpy of formation delta HF naught for B5H9? I know that's a little hard to see, but it says B5H9 gas at 298 Kelvin and 1 ATM, which is standard conditions. So we have to once again look at the reactions and see which one has the elements in their natural form. So it looks like H2 and B are the natural forms for hydrogen and boron, respectively, and it's definitely not B2. It's not going to be BH3. That's not an element. That's a compound, and this one is wrong. So D is our answer, and let's see if this makes sense. 5B and 9 over 2 times 2, which is going to be 9H, this will become B5H9. It makes sense, so D is correct. Now let's take a look at number 5. It gives us a nice reaction. C2H6 plus 7 over 2O2 becomes 2CO2 and 3H2O. And it gives us a delta H naught. That's nice, that's nice. If the enthalpy of vaporization for H2O liquid is 44.0 kilojoules per mole, what is the delta H for the reaction if H2O liquid is formed instead of H2O gas? So what they're basically saying is that what if this reaction produced a liquid instead of a gas? So let's rewrite this reaction so that it reflects that. So C2H6 gas plus 7 over 2O2. It's nice that they balanced it for us so we don't have to do it ourselves. And plus 3H2O liquid. Now, the only difference between the reaction here and here is that this is a gas and this is a liquid. So, how might we go from here to here? Well, in one of the videos, I did something that was similar to this and it involves Hess's Law. So, we start off with the reaction that they gave us, C2H6 gas plus 7 over 2O2 gas becomes 2CO2 gas plus 3H2O gas. And we know that the delta H naught for this reaction is negative 1427.7 kilojoules per mole of reaction. Now, we have to make it so that this gas becomes a liquid, and we could do that using Hess's Law. So we could write out the enthalpy of vaporization equation. So one mole of H2O liquid becomes one mole of H2O gas, and this corresponds to the delta H of vaporization for H2O. And it says that the delta H of vaporization is going to be 44.0 kilojoules per mole. All right, now we need to figure out something. We need to figure out how to cancel out this 
I think the first thing we have to do is flip the reaction and then multiply by 3. So 3H2O gas becomes 3H2O liquid. And we flipped it, multiplied it by 3, so this will be multiplied by 3 and flipped, or the sign will change. So 44 times 3 times negative 1 will give us negative 132.0 kilojoules per mole of reaction. So now that we have these two reactions, reaction 1 and reaction 2, we can combine them. So notice how we purposely made it so that the three H2O gases cancel out, and we end up with basically the reaction on top. And from here, we will do Hess's law. So we will add this and this. So negative 1427.7, I believe, minus 132. We get that the delta H naught of this reaction will be, hmm, it will be negative 1559.7 kilojoules per mole of reaction. And the answer that best describes the answer we just came up with is going to be D. Next question. A gold ring that weighs 3.81 grams is heated to 84 degrees Celsius and placed in 50 grams of water at 22.1 degrees Celsius. What is the final temperature? Oh, wow. Okay, so they give us the specific heats of both of them. That's great. Let's try to figure out what exactly is happening. So this person has a piece of gold, which is going to be colored in yellow. It's 3.81 grams. That's cool. It has a specific heat of 0 0.129 joules per gram degree Celsius. And let's see, it's at 84 degrees Celsius. And then it's dropped into water, which apparently is at 22.1 degrees Celsius. And what else do they give us? It's 50.0 grams. And the specific heat is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. All right, and then it says, what is the final temperature when you combine them? So when they're combined, it will kind of look like this, and the temperature TF will be, who knows, right? We have to calculate that. So we have to think about this in terms of what gains heat and what loses heat. So the Q or the heat change of the gold bar will be equal to negative of the heat that is gained by the water. So the heat that the gold loses to the water will be gained by the water. And I talked about in the video where this has to be negative since if this is losing energy, this is gaining energy and you have to negate it since they're opposite things, but they're the same magnitude. So we have to use the formula Q equals MC delta T to help us in this problem. So for gold, Q equals MC delta T, the mass of gold is 3.81 grams. And I just noticed that it was a gold ring and not a gold bar, but it doesn't really matter because in the end, it's still 3.81 grams of gold. And the C, the specific heat for gold is 0 0.129 joules per gram degree Celsius. And let's see, the temperature change. Well, delta T is TF minus TI. We don't know what TF is, but we know that the initial temperature of the gold was actually 84 degrees Celsius. And for specific heat problems, we can keep the degree Celsius sign because we are dealing with change in temperature. So 84.0 degree Celsius. And this is equal to the Q for H2O, which is don't forget the negative because we have a negative there. So negative MC delta T, the mass of water was 50.0 grams. And let's see, what's our specific heat? 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. And the delta T is going to be TF minus the initial temperature of the water, 22.1 degrees Celsius. And we simply just have to solve for TF, which is the only variable so below, all I simply did was simplify everything into an algebraic equation that was solvable. So 
Up here, I just decided to ignore all the units because I knew that my final answer was going to have the right units based on the setup that I did. And I just looked at the numbers. I multiplied these two and distributed it among these two. And I did the same thing for the second part where I multiplied all of this and I distributed it to these two. And I got this. And I kept track of sig figs by using the underlining technique. And in the end, I just simplified it more and more. And in the end, I got 22.2 degrees Celsius. And that seems like A to me. So I don't have an extra page to do this. So I'm just going to clear the ink. And we know that that's A. So let's move on to number seven. Calculate the change in enthalpy delta H for the combustion of 11.2 liters of hydrogen gas measured at 0 degrees Celsius and 1 atm pressure to form H2O gas. Now, notice the wording of this question. It's asking for the change in enthalpy for the combustion of a certain amount of gas. If they don't specify how much gas or how much stuff, then you assume one mole. But it's not the case here, because in this case, they say the change in enthalpy or you could think of it as the change in heat, since heat and enthalpy are really related for exactly 11.2 liters. So we have to be careful about this one. It's not per mole, it's per 11.2 liters because they specified that the change in enthalpy was for 11.2 liters. And for that reason, we just have to follow their specifications and go with the flow. So let's see what they're asking. So they are combusting hydrogen gas, which looks like this. H2 gas plus O2 gas becomes H2O gas. And since there's a delta H of formation here, I'm going to do this so that there's one mole here, since that's what delta HFF means. It's for one mole of substance formed. So put a one half there, and this would be the delta H of F. And the delta HFF turns out to be negative 241.8 kilojoules per mole. All right. Now it is asking, oh, what if I combusted 11.2 liters of this stuff at 0 degrees Celsius and 1 atm to form that stuff? What is the change in enthalpy or heat? Okay, well, we need to find the moles since this reaction has to be read in moles because this delta H, F, is for one mole of H2O formed. So let's get right along and do that. So P, V equals N, R, T. And our pressure is one, and our volume is going to be 11.2. And this is equal to N, which is unknown, times R, 0 0.0821, and our temperature is going to be 273.15 Kelvin. And doing the math, 11.2 divided by 0 0.0821 times 273.15 in parentheses, we get that the number of moles is equal to about 0 0.499 moles of H2. So if you remember, this delta H can be read in many ways. It could be read as, for every one mole of H2O formed, 241.8 kilojoules are released. Or, maybe, when one mole of H2 is consumed, negative 241.8 kilojoules is the delta H. So you could read this in many ways. And in this case, I'm going to read it as, for every mole of H2, 241.8 kilojoules of energy is released as heat and we have 0 0.499 moles of H2 that are reacting and via proportions we can cancel these out and we just simply multiply 0 0.499 times negative 241.8 and we get that the change in enthalpy or heat for 0.499 moles of H2 is going to be about 121 kilojoules per 11.2 liters of H2 at STP. And hey, this was at STP, so we could have done 
22.4 liters in a mole, but I didn't do that because I guess I like to do it this way. So it seems like our answer is going to be negative 121 kilojoules, which is B. So let's move on to the next question. Which process is exothermic? Well, we have to think about this. Condensation is when a gas becomes a liquid. And in order to do that, you have to lose some energy because this is at a higher energy state and this is at a lower energy state. So if you want to go from a gas to a liquid, you gotta lose some energy. And that's an exothermic process because it releases energy. So A is our answer. And fusion, sublimation, and vaporization involve substances that gain energy. So for fusion, a solid is becoming a liquid. And in order for that to happen, the solid needs a lot of energy to overcome the intermolecular forces to become a liquid. So because of that, this is going to be endothermic. And thus, you know, A is the only one that's odd. And for that reason, 8 will be A. Number 9. Using the thermodynamic information, calculate the delta H for the reaction. Okay, well, I think this is Hess's law. So let's try using Hess's law. So for the first reaction, I think that I'm going to flip it and multiply it by 2. And that's because there's 2 NO for the net reaction, and there's an NO there. And it has to be 2, so I have to multiply by 2, and I have to flip it because the final net reaction has the NO on the left side, so I have to flip it and multiply by 2. So let's get going and do that. 2 NO gas becomes N2 gas plus O2 gas, and the delta H will be flipped and multiplied by 2. So we have to go times negative 1, which is the flipped, and times 2, because the reaction coefficients were multiplied by 2. So 90.4 times negative 1 times 2 is going to be, well, let's see, negative 180.8 kilojoules per mole of reaction. All right, what's next? Well, we have to think about what we want to do next. Hmm, it looks like the third reaction is perfectly fine because there's one N204 here and one N204 there. So I'd like where that is. So I'll just keep it like that. So 2 NO2 gas becomes N2O4 gas, and this has a delta H naught of negative 58 kilojoules per mole. Okay, what about the last reaction? Well, the last reaction is going to be the second reaction, and I left it for last because I want to use that reaction to cancel out the chemicals. So let's think about this. In our final reaction, we actually don't have any NO2 because we only have NO, O2, and N2O4. So we have to find a way to cancel out the NO2, which is over here, since it doesn't exist in the net reaction. So what can we do? Well, the NO2 is on the left-hand side, and there are two moles of them, and the NO2 is on the right side for this one, and maybe all we have to do is multiply by 2, and you'll see what happens. So if we multiply by 2, the 1 half N2 becomes N2 gas, plus, let's see, 2 O2 gas becomes 2 N O2 gas. And the delta H will simply be multiplied by 2. So 33.8 times 2 is going to be 67.6 kilojoules per mole. And notice that when I do this, everything cancels out and everything works. So the NO2s cancel out. What else cancels out? Well, let's see. Hmm. Do the NOs cancel out? Well, I don't think they do. The N2s cancel out. There you go. And notice how the 2O2 and O2 cancel out, and you're left with 1O2 on this side. So it looks like our net reaction will be this, this, and this, since everything else is crossed out. So our final reaction will be 2NO gas plus O2 gas becomes N2O4 gas. And the delta H for this will be the sum of the three delta H's, so negative 180.8 minus 58 
plus 67.6. And let me see if that 58 had a point zero. Yeah, I did have a point zero. Can't mess up those sig figs there. That's pretty erroneous to do since messing up sig figs can hurt your answer. So minus 58 plus 67.6, I get that the delta H not of the overall reaction is negative 171.2 kilojoules per mole of reaction. And which answer choice best describes that? Well, it looks like it's going to be A. So let's move on to the next question. Number 10 seems like a heat of formation question. It says, determine the enthalpy change for the reaction of five grams of iron three oxide with aluminum metal according to the equation. So it's nice that they give us an equation this time. And note that it says the enthalpy change for five grams of Fe2O3. So the enthalpy change is specified to be for five grams and not for a mole. Mm. So as a result, we have to find how much heat is released by five grams of the substance. Or maybe the heat might be absorbed. Who knows, right? Let's figure out the delta H of this reaction first in order to figure out whether it's going to be exothermic or endothermic. Hmm. Okay, so we have to obviously find a way to do the summations. So the product's mass reactants, I think that's what I'm going to do. So we have one mole of Al2O3, so negative 1675.7, and that is added to the delta H of F for iron, liquid, and this is going to be 2 moles, so we have to multiply by 2, and it's 12.4, and then we have to subtract by the delta HFs for the reactants. So, Fe2O3, there's one of them, so negative 825.5, and the heat of formation for aluminum solid is 0 because aluminum solid is found naturally in nature as aluminum solid. So therefore, the heat of formation for that is zero. So we don't include that. So it turns out the delta H of the reaction is going to be negative 825.4 kilojoules per mole of reaction. Now we can read this in many ways. And since we're focusing on Fe2O3, since it says it wants to heat change for five grams of Fe2O3, Let's do it in terms of Fe2O3. So in this reaction, it says that 825.4 kilojoules is evolved when the reaction happens. And that's the same thing as saying when one mole of Fe2O3 is consumed, this much heat is released. So how about this? Let's read write it like this. 825.4 kilojoules per mole of Fe2O3. Now we just have to find the moles of iron 3 oxide. So how do we do that? Well, we know the molar mass of iron 3 oxide. And from the periodic table, it's going to be 159.70 grams per mole. So let's just convert the grams of Fe2O3 to moles. So 5 divided by the molar mass is going to be 0 0.0313 moles of Fe2O3. And doing the math, we get that, well, let's see what happens when we multiply these two numbers. We get that the heat that is released is going to be 25.8 kilojoules for every 5 grams of iron 3 oxide. So including 5.00 grams of iron 3 oxide is optional, but you could, but the answer is negative 25.8. So that's A. And now let's move on. So number 11, which of the following is a mathematical statement of the first law of thermodynamics? Well, the first law states that the change in internal energy is equal to the work plus the heat. So it looks like B fits that description perfectly. So let's move on to number 12. Now I forgot to add some things, but I added them there. And let's now read the question. Which statement about bonding is correct? A, a 
sigma bond has cylindrical symmetry around the bonding axis. Now, I'm not very sure about that, so I'll leave that open to debate. B. A pi bond is twice as strong as a sigma bond. That's not true. A sigma bond is stronger than a pi bond, so B is wrong. C. A double bond consists of two pi bonds. That's not true. A double bond consists of a sigma and a pi. That's wrong. D. A pi bond results from the sideways overlap of hybridized orbitals. Now, a pi bond, if you watched the previous videos or you just know, forms when two p orbitals of different atoms kind of link together and share electrons, and p orbitals are not hybridized. The hybridized orbitals include sp, sp2, and etc. So, d is out of the picture. And therefore, A is our answer. But why is it A? Well, a sigma bond, if you remember in the drawing class that we took when we were doing hybridization, a sigma bond kind of just looks like that. And a sigma bond is anything that's not a pi bond. So an overlap between two hybridized orbitals, such as sp or sp, these two will form a sigma bond. And the sigma bond will look like this. And it's asking, whether this has cylindrical symmetry. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, cylindrical symmetry means if you stick an axis through here and you rotate it around, like maybe you're cooking a fish or something on a stick, then the shape of the orbitals will stay the same and the orientation won't really change. And this makes sense because if you imagine yourself sticking a stick through a balloon through its middle and you're rotating it and pretend the balloon doesn't pop, then you notice how the balloon will kind of look the same no matter how you rotate it. So that's what cylindrical symmetry means and it definitely applies to sigma bonds, so A is our answer. Now number 13, we're back to good old math. Oh, this chapter has so much math in it, but we can do this because nothing can stop us when we're on number 13 and we're almost done. So. A 2.00 gram sample of ice at 0 degrees Celsius is placed in a 50.0 gram of water initially at 25 degrees Celsius in an insulated container. What is the final temperature after the system has achieved equilibrium? So let's actually imagine what's happening. So you have a container with, let's do it in blue, 50.0 grams of water. And you have this little ice cube that's two grams and this two gram ice cube is just sitting there and it has a temperature of 0.0, .0 degrees celsius the water initially has 25.0 degrees celsius and the specific heat for water is going to be 4.184 joules per gram degree celsius and it says the delta h not a fusion for ice is 6.01 kilojoules per mole. So we have to think about what's happening. So we have to use our brains and kind of work it out a little bit. So the heat that is absorbed by the ice since it's colder is equal to the negative of the heat that is released by the water. So we have to set up Q equals mc delta t. Now, we have to hold on a minute because if you think about it, the ice over here will turn into a liquid as it melts since the melting point of water is zero degrees Celsius. So in the Q for the ice, we have to consider the heat that it takes to both melt the ice into water and get the temperature of that now water up. And we have to consider, of course, the 50 grams of water cooling down. So the Q of the ice will be equal to the Q it takes to melt, of course, and the Q of the water when it heats up. And this is equal to the negative of the Q of the other water when it cools down. So we're considering two bodies of water and we consider them separately so we don't kind of confuse ourselves with a bunch of unnecessary thoughts. So how much energy will it take to melt two grams of ice? So, hmm, we could use the heat of fusion to help us out. So we know that 
a mole of ice takes 6.01 kilojoules to melt. So we can kind of, you know, convert this into the energy it takes to melt 2 grams of ice. So the molar mass of water is 18.02 grams per mole. And we simply divide 2 grams of ice or water, or H2O, by 18.02. And we get that we have 0 0.111 moles of ice that we're going to melt. And doing the math, we get 6.01 times 0.111, and we get that the amount of heat it takes to melt the ice is going to be 0 0.667 kilojoules. And we want to do this in joules, so we will say that the heat it takes to melt is going to be 667 joules of heat. Now, since we only have water after the ice melts, then we just have to think about how much heat the water gains here and how much heat the water loses here. So things that go up in temperature or decrease in temperature involve Q equals MC delta T. So let's get going and use that. So the mass of the water, once it melts, it's still going to be 2.00 grams. And the C is 4.184 since it's water. And T is going to be the final temperature minus the initial temperature, which is actually just 0, 0.0 degrees Celsius. And this is equal to the negative of the mass of the water, which is 50.0 grams. And let's not write the unit since that's confusing. Times 4.184 times Tf minus, what's the initial temperature of the 50 grams of water? 25.0 degrees Celsius. So notice that it's all algebra from here and we just have to solve for Tf. So using the magic of algebra, I simplified everything and I ended up getting this and I kept track of sig figs and I underlined the sig figs there and Tf turns out to be 21.0. And look at that. It's nice to see that the answer you calculate is in one of the answer choices, and therefore number 13 is going to be A. Now let's move on to number 14. If the average carbon-hydrogen bond association enthalpy, or the bond enthalpy if you don't read this dissociation part, in ethane is 416 kilojoules per mole, then what is the bond the association enthalpy of the carbon-carbon bond in ethane. Okay, well, interesting questions asked, and I think that this involves delta H of Fs as well as bond enthalpy. So we have two concepts combined into one question. So we have to figure out what they're asking. So, hmm, this is going to be a bit tricky because they give us C2H6, H, and C. Now this is really odd to see because they're giving us the delta H of formations for things that are not naturally found, and it's kind of weird to deal with, but we can do this. So where have I seen a compound being broken down? Well, we see things being broken down when we're talking about bond enthalpy. So why don't we go ahead and draw C2H6, since that should not pose a huge challenge to Lewis structure experts, and this is broken down into two C's, and they're all gases, plus six H's, and that's a gas as well. And notice how all the bonds are broken. So something interesting is going to happen, definitely. How about this? In order to start off, let's try to find the delta H of this reaction, since we have the delta H of formations for, you know, every compound or element. So let's get going. So the heat of formations for the products will be 2 times, well, what's carbon? 718.4 plus 6 times hydrogen, which is 217.9. And we have to subtract that by the heat of formations of the reactants. And the only reactant is going to be C2H6, which is negative 84.7. And we get that the delta H naught for the reaction is going to be 2829 kilojoules per mole of reaction. So now that we have the delta H of the reaction, what can we do next? They give us the 
bond enthalpy for the carbon hydrogen and it says the bond enthalpy is going to be 416 kilojoules per mole and it wants us to find the bond enthalpy for the carbon carbon so how do we do that exactly well we can now solve this question in terms of bond enthalpies so let's look at the reactants so for the reactants we have six moles of CH bonds, so 6 times the bond enthalpy for one CH bond, which is 416, so 416, and we also have one CC double bond, so plus 1 times the bond enthalpy for the CC double bond, which we don't know actually, so we are going to leave that as our variable, and what are our products well our products have no bonds no bonds are being formed at all so we don't have to worry about using any negative bond enthalpies so this will be equal to the total change in enthalpy which we calculated using the heat of formations and that's 2829 and from here it's all algebra so 6 times 416 is going to be 2496 plus the bond enthalpy of a carbon carbon single bond, and this is 2829. And we subtract 2829 by 2496, and we get the bond enthalpy for a carbon carbon single bond in ethane is going to be 333 kilojoules per mole of CC single bond. So, are there any answer choices that say 333? Well, of course there are. It's B. Now let's move on to the hardest question in my opinion. This one's going to involve a lot of thinking. So, a 2.00 gram sample of solid, whoa, I don't know how to pronounce that. Oh, I do. Rubidium chlorate. And this is added to 100.0 grams of water, both initially at 23.00 degrees Celsius in a well-insulated container. The final temperature of the solution is 21.56 degrees Celsius. What is the delta H of solution of rubidium chlorate? Assume that the specific heat capacity of the solution is the same as that of pure water and neglect the heat capacity of the insulated container. Okay, so we have to understand what's happening. The delta H of solution, if you watched the types of delta H video, is the enthalpy change when one mole of rubidium chlorate or any other solid is dissolved and turned into its aqueous form rubidium chlorate aqueous and how does this work well let's see what the question is asking so it basically states that two grams of the rubidium chlorate is added to so 2.00 grams is added to water and if it's added to water, we're assuming that it dissolves since it's asking for the delta H of solution. So it dissolves. So the 2.00 grams of the salt will dissolve. And this corresponds to a delta H or a change in heat because initially the solution's at 23.00 degrees Celsius. And after adding it, it cools down to 21.56. Now this is telling me that since the surroundings is cooling down, this must be an endothermic reaction since things are cooling down and the reaction is taking heat from its surroundings and cooling the surroundings. So now that we know all this, let's try to figure out what exactly is happening. So I know I said that twice, but it's honestly hard to figure out what's exactly happening. So when 2.00 grams of the salt dissolves, it will release a certain amount of heat and all this heat will be absorbed by the water. Now, the water is no longer water. It's actually a solution. And a solution weighs 102 grams because 100 grams is the water and two grams is the salt. So the solution weighs 102 grams. And it says that the specific heat of the solution is 4.184. So let's keep that in mind and let's do the problem. So let's see how much heat the water gained. So the Q of the water is equal to the M, which is 102 because it's the mass of the solution and the solution has the same specific heat as that of pure water. And 
C is 4.184, and delta T is going to be 21.56 minus 23.00, and we get negative 1.44. And doing the math, 102 times 4.184 times negative 1.44, we get that the change in heat for the water is negative 614, actually no, 615 joules. And this means that the water lost that much heat. And that occurred probably because the reaction stole the heat because it's endothermic. So the reaction caused the water to lose that much heat. Now, the Q of the reaction is actually equal to the negative Q of water. Now, this is because when the reaction absorbs energy, the water loses that energy to the reaction. So it's that thing where Q of system is equal to negative Q of surroundings. Same idea, we've done this a few times. So the Q of the water is, of course, negative 615 joules because it cooled down. And we take the negative of that to get the actual amount of heat that the reaction absorbed. So it turns out the reaction absorbed 615 joules. And that makes sense since the reaction is endothermic. So it should have a positive value, right? So now that we know this information, it states that for every two grams of rubidium chlorate, um, this much heat is absorbed. So we have to find it per mole because it wants the delta H of solution. And that's the amount of heat Q per mole. So let's find out how many moles of rubidium chloride we had. So 2 divided by 184.92 is going to be 0 0.0108 moles. And let me add the zero there. And this is moles of rubidium chlorate. And it states that, well, according to our calculations, 615 joules was absorbed by the reaction for every 0 0.0. 108 moles of the reactant, which is rubidium chlorate. And we know that delta H is equal to Q over moles. So doing the math, 615 divided by that is going to be a gigantic number. It's going to be 5.69 times 10 to the fourth joules. Now, let me see if I'm right about that. One, two, three, four. All right. I think this is the right answer. But they want it in kilojoules, so we have to convert it to kilojoules, and we multiply by 10 to the negative 3, and we get 5.69 times 10 to the 1 kilojoules, and this is the same thing as 56.9 kilojoules, and which one best resembles that? Well, it looks like D is close enough, so D will be our answer for number 15, and now let's go on to number 16. Which of the following is not a state function? Well, energy is a state function, pressure is a state function, mass is a state function, but work is not a state function. And the reason why these three are state functions is because when you look at something, it has a certain amount of energy, a certain amount of pressure, and a certain amount of mass, and that's depending on the state. But meanwhile, when you look at work, work depends on the path the object takes, and it doesn't just depend on the state, so it's not a state function. So D is your answer, and I know there was a lot of math involved, and it was really tiresome, honestly, but we made it through, and we learned a lot. So thanks for watching, and have a nice day.